A high fat diet has been shown to increase gut permeability. This means it causes leaky gut. How does it do this? Please follow us on Instagram at High Carb Health and don't forget to click on that green H so you follow our stories and get to see everything that we eat and do throughout the day. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, click on that subscribe button and the bell notification icon so you are notified of all future videos. Hey guys, today we're looking at the gut microbiome and especially looking at high fat diets and the effect they have on our gut bacteria. When we look at the science, even though the science on the gut microbiome is in its infancy, it's actually pretty clear and giving some very good indications as to what the good bacteria in our gut likes to feed on. So what we're going to look at is the difference between a high fat diet and a low fat diet or a high carbohydrate plant rich diet and the effect it has on the microbiome and the composition of the microbiome in our gut. Now the composition of the gut microbiome is of particular importance to people who have IBD and gut or digestive issues, isn't it? Because we know that because of our diet and lifestyle, we create certain situations which create an imbalance in the gut bacteria or the microbiome in our bodies. And while there's no consensus on the ideal composition of the human gut microbiota, there are particular patterns of dysbiosis, underrepresentation of certain bacterial species and overrepresentation of others, which are strongly linked with a heightened risk of various diseases. Inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease and cancer are just some of the diseases that have been linked to imbalanced gut microbiota. So interestingly, when we look at the microbiome, we are not just saying, okay, the microbiome is out of whack. And so that's the cause of the disease. What we do is we think about, okay, what caused the microbiome to become like that? What is it in our diet and lifestyle that created that situation? And then therefore, when we have that situation, obviously our body malfunctions and we get disease. And when we look at the microbiome of people who have certain diseases, obviously there's going to be a misrepresentation of certain types of bacteria. It's going to be out of balance. There's going to be dysbiosis. But the dysbiosis is not the cause of the issue. The cause of the issue happened before the dysbiosis happened in the first place. So we have to take it back to the root cause, look at our diet and lifestyle, and that's when we can determine how to make certain changes and when we look at the science, the data tells us exactly what we need to do. And let's get into it. So the overall diversity and specific composition of our gut microbiota are affected by numerous dietary components, including total protein and proportions of protein from animal versus plant sources, total fat and proportion of saturated fat versus unsaturated fat. There's fiber, there's resistant starch, polyphenols and sugar. All of these things have a role to play in the makeup of our gut microbiome. No wonder it's such a complicated issue. Uh, however, there is one pattern that makes it very easy and as we go through the research, it'll make it it'll be very clear what that dietary pattern is. So first of all, let's talk about the high fat diet. A high fat diet has been found to reduce colon bacteria overall, while increasing total anaerobic microflora and bacterioides counts. Interestingly, bacterioides are normally beneficial microorganisms, but overgrowth is associated with inflammatory bowel disease, severe antibiotic resistant infections, and colorectal cancer. So one of the types of high fat diets that is very popular is the ketogenic diet. And it has been studied quite extensively and initially it was, you know, created so that it could help people who had epileptic seizures. It was nothing to do with gut bacteria, there was nothing to do with weight loss, it was only really prioritized for this very, very niche and small group of people. And it did seem to have some benefits, but there were a lot of downsides to it as well. And when they were doing research on the ketogenic diet and how the impact it had on other issues in the body, some of the results were quite startling. For example, this study here, uh, it's the glucose transporter one deficiency syndrome, which is a cause of epileptic seizures. What they found was after three months on a ketogenic diet, there was a significant increase in a group of bacteria known to produce hydrogen sulfide. Now, hydrogen sulfide is a gas which causes gut inflammation and is linked to the development of inflammatory bowel disease. So really, having something like hydrogen sulfide in our gut is not what we want. And so choosing a high fat diet is creating the exact opposite kind of situation to what we want in our gut. And while there may be some short term symptom relief with that, the inflammation is not going in the right direction if you look at 
Delta studies and what the research is telling us. And hydrogen sulfide has a big role to play in that because it is something that causes inflammation. And we do not want this type of gas in our, in our bowels at all. In another study, they looked at people at high risk of metabolic syndrome. So switching from a diet high in saturated fat, which is typical of a ketogenic diet, to a low fat diet, increased the numbers of beneficial bifidobacterium, and this correlated with reduced fasting glucose and total cholesterol. In other words, this created a total reversal of the metabolic syndrome that these people had. A high fat diet has been shown to increase gut permeability. This means it causes leaky gut. How does it do this? What it does is it turns off the genes that code proteins that compromise tight junctions, which is the seals between neighboring intestinal cells. Tight junctions are intended to stop unwanted or dangerous gut contents, such as undigested proteins and bacterial toxins from leaking through the gut walls and into the bloodstream. One of those toxins is endotoxin, a component of the cell walls of gram-negative bacteria. Now you hear about us talking about toxins a lot, don't you? We talk about the level of toxicity which is creating these bowel issues and if we want to heal we need to be able to detoxify our bodies and remove the amount of toxicity that's uh, inherently causing the inflammation in our bodies. And when we eat these high fat diets we are creating the perfect situation for the body to create endotoxins which trigger low-grade inflammation in our bowels. Saturated fat intake in particular increases the absorption of endotoxin from the gut into the bloodstream and the resulting endotoxemia triggers inflammation and is associated with reduced glucose tolerance which can eventually lead to diabetes, weight gain and oxidative stress. That's funny isn't it because a lot of people tell us that our high carbohydrate diet is what leads to reduced glucose intolerance or creates diabetes because of the amount of sugar and therefore you know, it's going to be dangerous for us and all, all these other things that we get told about. But if you look at the research, it's the high fat diet which reduces these glucose tolerances, which creates insulin resistance, which creates diabetes. So if you want to get diabetes out of your system, or if you want to not have to deal with blood sugar issues, which are linked to candida and things like that, we need to be looking at reducing the fat in our diet, not increasing it. High fat intake also increases the amount of bile secreted by the gallbladder into the small intestine. This increases the relative abundance of bacterial species that use bile as a food source. High counts of these bacteria are associated with increased inflammation. High counts of Bilophilia wadsworthia has been linked to an increased incidence and the severity of colitis and colorectal cancer. So there you go, the high fat diet is the exact opposite of what you want when you're trying to reduce inflammation, get rid of issues like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, any other type of IBD or IBS, colon cancers. We do not want to be excessively loading the body with fat because that creates dysbiosis in the gut, leads to increased permeability and leaky gut. And it's just really the exact opposite, as I said, of what we want to create symbiosis in our body. However, when people are talking about high fat diets, what they end up doing is they start putting carbohydrates, all of them in the same boat. You know, they don't differentiate between whole food carbohydrates and refined carbohydrates. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that people who are proponents of high fat diets or ketogenic diets or any kind of paleo or whatever it is that you know, recommends eating lots and lots of fat. This is the biggest mistake that they've made because they have not taken into account the differences between when you refine a carbohydrate or you keep it intact in its whole food. Because when you do keep it intact, you get all the benefits that come with that whole food, including the fiber, including the vitamins, including the minerals, including the phytonutrients and the polyphenols. And it reacts completely differently in your body. And the science proves that. So when it comes to the microbiome, not all carbohydrates are created equal. Unrefined, minimally processed carbohydrate-rich foods such as whole grains, starchy vegetables, legumes, fruits contain non-digestible carbohydrates including fiber, resistant starch and non-starch polysaturides. These are dubbed microbiota accessible carbohydrates or MACs. Now unlike simple starches and sugars, these non-digestible carbohydrates are not broken down by the human digestive enzymes in the small intestine. They don't serve as a food source for us. Instead, they make it all the way down to the large intestine where our gut microbiota ferment them, producing not only an energy source for themselves, but a host of compounds which are beneficial for their hosts, us.
A diet low in max reduces total bacterial abundance, one of the major indicators of a healthy microbiota and the richness of their microbiome. As leading gut microbiome researchers Erica and John Sonnenberg put it, eating a low carbohydrate diet equates to starving our microbial self. The consequences of this impoverishment in total numbers and diversity of gut bacteria are not yet understood, but it is worth noting that humans who live a more primitive hunter-gatherer lifestyle such as the Hadza of northern Tasmania have far greater microbial richness and diversity than typical Westerners. Amazingly, this is a characteristic that is linked to a high consumption of plant foods, not meat. These people in the hunter-gatherer societies eat a huge amount of plants. In fact, in the Paleolithic times, we used to eat more than 100 grams of fiber every single day. Now let's talk about one of the products of bacterial fermentation of these MACs. Specifically, resistant starches and dietary fiber is butyrate. Butyrate has an astonishingly diverse suite of benefits, including providing the major fuel source to colonocytes, the cells lining the large intestine, maintaining the integrity of the gut lining, preventing and healing leaky gut, reducing mucosal inflammation, reducing visceral sensitivity, modulating intestinal motility, preventing and inhibiting colorectal cancer, reducing serum cholesterol, reducing insulin resistance, assisting with weight loss, preventing stroke, Increasing brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, which stimulates the growth of new nerve cells and connections between existing ones. Now, say you follow a ketogenic diet and you eat lots and lots of vegetables. Surely that's going to give you all the fiber and different types of max that you need, correct? Mm, not quite. Even if you're eating a ketogenic diet that's high in fiber but, lit, but low in carbohydrate vegetables, you cannot hope to achieve the quantity and diversity of MACs needed to cultivate a healthy and diverse gut microbiome. Non-fiber MACs such as resistant starch and non-starch polysaturates are found most abundantly in whole grains, legumes, and fruits, not in vegetables. Now let's look at the findings of the American Gut Project. This is a massive citizen science project that uses big data to help fill in knowledge gaps about the complex links between our diet and lifestyle habits, gut microbiota, and health status. This research recently reported that the single greatest predictor of microbial diversity is the number of different plant foods eaten per week. Participants who reported eating more than 30 different plant foods had the most diverse microbiota. It's easy to eat this many different plant foods on a whole food plant-based diet, but virtually impossible on a ketogenic or high-fat diet that excludes most fruits, starchy vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Funnily, a lot of people who recommend high-fat diets think that whole grains are some of the worst foods you can eat, but does the science support that? Whole grain consumption is consistently linked with improved health, including decreased risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and weight gain. And it is likely that many of the benefits of whole grain consumption are mediated to their effects on gut microbiomes. For example, diets rich in whole grain and wheat bran are linked to an increase in the bacteria, bifidobacteria and lactobacilli, while whole grain barley and resistant starches increase the abundance of butyrate producing bacteria. People with advanced colorectal cancer were found to have a lower fiber intake, reduced levels of butyrate and other short chain fatty acids and lower counts of fiber-loving bacteria than cancer-free controls. Okay, so that shows us that eating plants and high-fiber diets that are abundant in these types of MACs are extremely beneficial for our gut microbiome, and high-fat diets aren't. But what about protein or high-protein diets that lots of people have focused on today as well? You know, some people are really into that high-fat ketogenic style, but a lot of people also focused on this uh, high-protein style diet. And what impact does that, does that have on the gut bacteria? Bile tolerant anaerobes increase with the consumption of animal based protein, while beneficial bacteria are depleted by high protein, low carbohydrate diets, and consequently, lower butyrate production is, is observed in people following such diets. Fewer butyrate producing bacteria are found in the feces of inflammatory bowel disease patients than in healthy control patients. And high animal protein intake has been found to significantly increase the risk of developing this bowel disease. The dysbiotic pattern of increased bacterioides and diminished butyrate producing bacteria has also been identified in colorectal cancer patients. So the high protein diet is no better. Realistically, what we need to do is focus on eating a diverse range of whole plant foods. If we do that, 
we are feeding the symbiotic bacteria in our gut. The bacteria that we want to have in there. The bacteria that are going to produce all these beautiful short chain fatty acids that are very, very beneficial to our gut lining. And if we are following a high fat diet or a high pro protein diet, we are not doing these things. We are not giving our gut bacteria enough diversity to be able to produce uh, or give us the benefits that we want from our microbiome. And realistically, what we tend to find is that people who are following these high fat diets or high protein diets are constantly relying on probiotics to replenish their microbiome because they can't do it with their diet. So we're always seeing that they need to be drinking these uh, kefir drinks or taking probiotic pills or doing things like that, which really, I think, is not a long-term solution because you're creating dysbiosis with your diet and then you're trying to correct that by consuming probiotic bacteria. Why don't we just go to the root cause and stop eating the diets like the high-fat diet, the ketogenic diets that, that, that are so high in fat or the high-protein diets that create dysbiosis? Why do we just not stop doing that and eat the high... Uh, diversity of different plant foods which is automatically going to be a high carbohydrate diet by doing that we are creating the perfect situation for our gut bacteria because these are the foods that they like to feed on and therefore they're going to thrive in that type of environment and they're going to give us all the benefits that having a symbiotic microbiome gives us which is obviously you know going to be a great defense system and obviously reduce risk of disease and beneficial health in the long term. So I urge you, after watching the research that I've just presented to you, if you're following a high fat diet or a high protein diet, please rethink your decision. The science does not support these types of diets. We want you to look at shifting to a whole food plant-based diet, which is abundant in these types of max, which the symbiotic or good bacteria in our gut thrive on. So switch to whole food plant-based diet eat a diverse range of different whole plant foods and just watch the changes in the way your gut uh, is going to work. And this is what we see with our clients all the time. They see amazing benefits when they change their diet to a whole food plant-based diet. So give it a go for yourself. You know, just do it for 30 days and see what happens. I think you'll notice a big difference. If you do have IBD, however, giving this a go for 30 days may not be enough because your body needs to detoxify and heal the gut lining, which can take a lot longer than that. A lot of the time we see that because of the increased healing effort that is needed by the body, uh, a lot of people will see as a result of switching to a plant-based diet, a slight increase in symptoms before the symptoms start to get better. So if you're only going to give this a go for a short term, if you have some kind of gut digestive disorder, it's probably not going to be long enough. And I urge you to probably look at getting some support and some guidance to help you with that process. Okay, guys. Well, I think that was enough science for one day. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more videos like this, click on that subscribe button and the little bell notification, which will give you uh, notifications of each video we upload. If you have any questions about anything I've mentioned in today's video, please leave me a comment and I'll get back to it as soon as I can. All right, so thanks a lot again, guys, for watching this video and make sure you eat plants and lots of them. See you next time. Give this video a thumbs up if you know what it's like to live with IBD and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. This channel is designed to help people recover from colitis, Crohn's and any other form of IBD. You can always head to our website, highcarbhealth.com for a free 30 minute consultation from anywhere in the world. And remember, there is a life after colitis.